enough, amen? amen? God is good, and he's good for so many reasons, and one of the reasons that he is good is that we have the opportunity and freedom on a beautiful day to gather to worship his great name, and that is something that I often take for granted, but I hope that we don't do that collectively because it is an amazing opportunity to worship together. Welcome. We're glad you're here. If you're visiting with us today, we are so delighted that God brought you here this morning, hopefully on the way in. You got a guest card. If you didn't, make sure you get one of those on the way out. We can get that for you, um, and you can simply fill that out if you'd like to be followed up with it anyway. Um, but primarily, we love just having your email if you'd like to hear more about what God is doing here at 242. Uh, God is doing an amazing thing in our journey uh, with Boyertown Mennonite Church um, this month. God is going to bring us to the culmination of a, a little over five-month process of coming together as one church family. And so we're excited about that and for how God has just miraculously worked and brought that uh, just around the corner. So thank you for being here. Uh, today is a family Sunday, and that, all that means is that our elementary students, kindergarten to fifth grade, are with us during our message time today. We're thankful for that. Um, and uh, today... Like oftentimes as I preach on Family Sundays, try to um, incorporate some focused areas um, in the next generation of the church. And I think that's a beautiful thing that we have here um, as we pray and think about the future is that God is raising up right now. Right now our youth are the church. It's not something they wait for till later. They are the body of Christ if they profess Jesus Christ. And so we're excited to have them a part of that. You're probably a little puzzled as to why you got what you got on the way in. I thought that would go better, okay? Um, dad joke, I guess. We'll blame it on that. But hopefully, did anybody not get a uh, puzzle on the way in? Just raise your hand. We'll make sure. We still have some back there, John. We got one over here. Good. Um, we're going to come back to our puzzles in a little bit. Um, but we're going to be talking. Okay, we got two up here. Sorry. That's all right. Don't be shy. Just raise your hand big. We got puzzles. And Anybody need a handout while Larry's coming down the aisle as well? All s great. Both of these are tools. The back page of our handout is an opportunity for you to follow along with the message today um, as we move through a second week on just looking at the topic of what it means to be a church member, but also what does it mean to be a part of God's masterpiece that he is developing in his church um, called redemption. And so we're going to talk about that in just a few moments today as we dive into the word. Just a couple quick family announcements as we look to the future. You might notice the walls out and the lobby area are a little bare as we continue to take things down. But we're excited as we move through the next couple months, you're going to start seeing some different changes um, happening. But one of the things that's happening this week beginning is the painting of all the common areas. Um, and so if you love the smell of paint, next Sunday is going to be a really great Sunday for you. Okay, I was a painter for 10 years of my life, and I still enjoy the smell of fresh paint. Um, they've changed it a lot now. It's not as like potent, but it's still there. Um, but that'll happen. We're excited just about how God is uh, working in those ways and allowing us to, um, as we consider how to have a bigger group in this space, a lot of different things happening in the next couple months. So we're excited about that, and we'll keep you previewed on that. This Wednesday um, is senior lunch at 12 o'clock. Um, if you'd like to be a part of it, Tuesday. Thank you, Jen. That's why she sits right here. She keeps me in line Tuesday at 12 o'clock at the new Pied Piper. It's back. Better than ever, they say. So the Pied Piper out there heading out up north, up 100, um, they reopen, and so we'll be gathering there. If you'd like to participate in that, there's a sign-up sheet in the back, and you can also do that um, in our weekly update that has a lot of our other announcements. We can only always highlight a couple in this time, but there, that's what's happening. You can flow everything through that, please. Um, also, just uh, keep on your calendar, we are going to be doing just a, a couple different fundraisers. Um, you ask, how can you help uh, Honduras team get there? We have a group of 15 um, traveling over there in the first week of July. Um, and so there's just some different ways, and we wanted to, to incorporate all different types that might interest different people in the church. One way, coming up on the 26th, is a babysitting night um, where you can just drop your kids off um, and uh, make a donation to the team, and we're just going to hang out and have a good time with your kids. Um, and so I encourage you, if you want to take advantage of that, there's going to be a, um, a church movie night coming up, and we'll preview that with you. And then on June 2nd, after church, um, we're going to have a uh, cornhole tournament um, here. And um, it's a way to uh, just, again, 
help those individuals that are going on the team, raise money. Listen, you don't have to be good at cornhole. It's, it's a, a gift to the missions team, okay? So you can come up the whole time and just miss the board. You're doing it for a greater purpose, okay? If you do that at a normal cornhole tournament, you look silly. For this one, no. It's a donation to missions. Um, and so right after church, we will have that. Um, and we'll also have uh, lunch out there that will be provided. Um, so just keep those opportunities. We thank you for the way that you can partner with the team that is going. We're excited about um, ministering in Honduras this summer. Uh, also, just a church work day coming up on Saturday, May 11th. We will be in the morning time, um, have different jobs around the building, outside, uh, where you can come and just serve the Lord for a few hours. Uh, we'll make it for all ages, uh, probably not infants, okay, Naffenberger, sorry. But uh, everybody else, just come, and there will be a lot of different ways, both inside and outside, um, that we can kind of do a spring cleanup um, together as a church family. So keep some of those dates. Again, other things happening on uh, the church calendar as we look forward. Keep looking at that weekly update. Uh, last but not least, uh, it's been a joy this weekend. I've been busy over the last week and then this morning. Uh, some of you are here at 8 o'clock for our member vision meeting. Um, so they're going to get a lot of Brian today, okay, as they hear my voice. But um, just an opportunity to talk. A lot of that is about the vision of the church. So you don't have to be a member of either congregation. Um, however, it is something that we're encouraging all current members of both BMC and 242 to come and be a part of and hear what God's doing in the process, um, looking a lot ahead at the future. So the last one that you can attend is tomorrow evening. Um, and so if you do plan on coming, we just ask that you please sign up as we're planning. It's been a great number each time, and we're excited about just what God's, how God is using those times of just coming back and saying, all right, what's this all about? Well, what's God doing? Looking back at his faithfulness to this point, but also looking to the future to say, all right, what does this look like now as we come together as a congregation? Um, April 28th is still our planned uh, day to vote. And what that's going to look like is on Monday, you're going to receive an email uh, that has all the uh, updated documents that we have been working on. Um, and it's going to kind of just highlight and preview what the next steps are for all of us. Um, but on Sunday, April 28th, um, after the service, um, if you are a member of BMC, you're going to go into the gym and um, have your voting in there. And we, 242, we will have our voting in here. Again, just as a reminder, uh, it's not like there's two separate votes going on. Um, there is the same vote. However, we want the BMC individuals and that congregation to not get lost in the greater whole. This is an exciting thing for the BMC members to be able to vote on. Um, and we want to see um, that there's a unified vision with all of them. They'll also be voting on a second um, in cemetery endowment fund that will be part of their vote. Um, which is an important part of this process. We didn't realize that having a cemetery, and that is a ministry of a church, it's actually a community ministry um, because uh, it, it's part of, yes, it's attached to the church and the church space and the church property, um, but it's also open. Some of the folks that are buried up there are just community members, and we want to keep that vision because there's often times of great ministry uh, when someone passes away. Um, but they're, what we are able to do is set aside um, from BMC's funds, a fund that will go towards that. Ruth and Kim are going to come and share a full financial update um, in just a moment. But I want to just uh, say that that meeting tomorrow night and then also the 28th will be when we vote. We need to, someone asked a good question today, and thank you for asking it, is if I'm not here on the 28th, do we have absentee ballots? We have done that for other things, for digital, so we will get you details for that. We don't do mail-in ballots, okay, because like, what can happen with those, Okay. Um, but we will do a uh, ballot, a digital ballot for that, and uh, we'll let you know on the information for that moving forward. I'm thankful for the different gifts and abilities. Today we're going to talk about the gifts in the church. And as we come together, it's just been so neat to see and learn about the gifts of those in BMC and then being aware of the gifts that are, are present in the 242 church. And let me just say, like, Seeing that come together on a daily basis is, is a very humbling thing and a very uh, just neat thing that God's doing. And uh, one of the areas that that is taking place is in our finances. And so um, for Kim Kramer serves as our treasurer for 242. She is going to come up and just give a general um, financial update 
for quarter three. We haven't done that in a while and all the minutia of everything going on. Um, and so she is going to do that. And then Ruth Stolzfus has served as the treasurer of BMC for a long time. Um, and Kim and Ruth have been working together on a, the process of bringing our budget together. So Ruth is just going to give us an update from that perspective. So Kim, if you would come forward now and give the financial update. We thank you for uh, your ministry in this area and the work that you do behind the scenes of tracking all of the numbers and different things going on. morning. Um, as Brian stated, I'm Kim Kramer, if any of you don't know me, and I've been the treasurer of 242 Community Church for less than a year. So I'm going to give a quick update of where we are on the budget. Um, but first, I wanted to say, when I first said yes to the treasurer position, I was like, okay, I, th I think I can handle this. And then we said, okay, we're merging. And I went, oh no, <laughs> I don't know if I can handle this. And then I met Ruth and I was like, oh, this is perfect because she, melt, she made me felt at ease and she's great to work with and I'm just really thankful for that. So um, our fiscal year runs from July 1st to June 30th, which means we're a little over three quarters of the way through our fiscal year. Uh, last year with our church growing, we took a step of faith and increased our budget with the hopes of hiring an assistant pastor. So with this increase in our monthly budget, um, the monthly budget amount is $18,100. This was the anticipated amount for both giving and expenses when the budget was created for this fiscal year. Here's where we stand as of March 31st of this year. Our three month giving average, that's our income for January through March of 2024 is $15,120. Our year to date expenses averaged over the months is $14,370 per month. The main reason for the difference between our actual expenses and the budgeted expenses is because we did not hire that assistant pastor yet. So the expenses associated with that have not been realized. As we plan our budget for next year, we are planning on a half a year salary for that assistant pastor um, in hopes of having him in place by January 1st of 2025. So our current bank accounts, um, these numbers are as of March 31st, are as follows. In checking, we have $31,004. Uh, in the benevolence checking account, there's $636. And in our savings account, there's $100,547. Now these account balances have grown um, over the past year, and we hope that they continue to grow as we look at future building plans and projects. The savings was never meant as a place to just like hold on to money. It's like truly a saving so that we're ready and able to finance plans as God leads us. <laughs> as Brian spoke about, soon you'll be seeing a few projects um, going on around here, like painting, um, flooring, chairs in the sanctuary. Uh, these projects um, will come from the account for our rent. We were paying previously $3,200 a month for rent in our old building, so we do have a surplus, so there won't need to be any special budget changes for those projects. Now, I realize this is a very brief summary, and some of you might have questions. I welcome that. Feel free to contact me. Um, my email and cell are in the directory, or you can just come to me with any questions. And now, Ruth. Um, the treasurer of Boyertown Mennonite Church will come and share some information about the combining of our budgets for next year. Good morning. Um, Kim and I, Kim and myself, when we got together the first time, we each had kind of the same perspective of how to merge the two budgets. And so going forward, we will be using the QuickBooks. And so what we did was put, injected our budget into the current 242's budget. The building and administrative expenses were increased, but we did not anticipate a major change. Ministries within our church were also increased slightly. 
Now here I'm going to be repeating. <laughs> Included in the budget with the salaries and the hourly paid personnel is the projected hope of an associate pastor. For the BMC folks, a change will be made concerning mission giving. Instead of a schedule giving to a number of designated ministries and missions, giving will flow from a heart of generosity through Generosity Sunday and other designated ministries, perhaps larger gifts to fewer ministries. As most of you know, and it was just spoken of this morning, there is a cemetery adjoining our church property. It's a part of the church's real estate. BMC has been blessed with an endowment fund, and it has been decided to keep a large part of that fund, 120000 in what will be na named the Boyertown Mennonite Community Cemetery Endowment Fund. Its purpose, the maintenance and improvement of the cemetery. This fund is invested with Everence Foundations. The remainder of that fund will then be transferred to the church's savings account. And we are planning to present the 24-25 budget in May. Then concerning offerings, you may continue giving the way that is familiar to you, but after the merger, there will be one offering box at the back for anyone giving in that manner. So I think that's all I have to say. Thank you. <laughs>
When there's nothing good in me, you are love, you are love, on display for all to see. You are light, you are light, when the darkness closes in. You are hope, you are hope, you have covered all my sin. You are peace, you are peace, when my fear is crippling. You are true, you are true, even in my wandering. You are joy, you are joy, you're the reason that I sing. You are life, you are life, in you death has lost its sting. And oh, I'm running to your arms, I'm running to your arms, the riches of your love will always be enough, nothing compares to your embrace, light of the world forever Sing, you are more. You are more, you are more than my words will ever say. You are Lord, you are Lord, all creation will proclaim. You are here, you are here, in your presence I'm made all. You are God, you are God, of all else I'm letting go. And oh, I'm running to your arms, I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace, light of the world forever. sing no other name Jesus Jesus my heart will sing no other name Jesus Jesus and though I'm running and though I'm running to your arms I'm running to your arms the riches of your love will always be enough nothing compares to your embrace light of the world forever rain. I'm running to your arms I'm running to your arms the riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the world forever we thank you for your welcome and your generosity that even in spite of the many things that cause us to be imperfect that cause us to fail you don't want us to dwell there you don't want us to stay there and just like the prodigal son recognized the goodness of the father and ran to his father's arms or met the father as he ran to him 
you desire for us to come to you even this morning to seek forgiveness and welcome in you. Thank you. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best Lord, my day. King of heaven, my victory won. May I reach heaven's joys, proud bright heaven's sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever before, still be my vision O ruler of all still be my vision still be my All right, I'm going to be reading out of 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 to 20, uh, 26, 27, sorry. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so, as, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing? If the whole body was an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need 
for, of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on, and on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor, and our unpre unpresentable parts are treated with greater, greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has not composed, but God has so composed, the body giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, and that there many be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice. Now you are the body of Christ and individually, and, yeah, and individually members of it. If you want to turn your attention to this. All right, Greg, let's move to the next one. I am officially an OG because I love videos of how things are made. I love, I enjoy watching that. That is such a fascinating thing because we often look at everything. Everything that you have seen today has a designer. You realize that everything that we see on a daily basis has a designer behind it, a person who created the parts that make an object, the car you drove in, designed, the pew you sit in, designed, the gathered people of God, the body of Christ, the church is no different. It is uniquely designed by the divine designer, the God of the universe, and so as we think about this morning, 
of our part in God's plan, I want to just jump right into the big idea. The body of Christ allows me to play my part as a piece of God's masterpiece called redemption. The body of Christ allows me to play my part as a piece of God's masterpiece called redemption. Just as a piece of art has the name Mona Lisa, the Last Supper, just as a piece of art has a name, so does the work of God. And it has a, call, a name called redemption. Our part and our interaction with God is a unique one. It's for all mankind, but for each one of us, we've experienced, if you're a child of God and have professed faith in Jesus Christ, it is unique to each of us in how God has brought us to himself. Where are my puzzle enthusiasts this morning? Where are you? Okay, where are you? All right, wow, more than I thought, okay? I think puzzles are like olives. You either love them or you hate them. That's kind of how I've understood puzzles as I look at the landscape. Um, puzzles are a fascinating thing. There's something therapeutic about doing a puzzle. The slow and steady gratification of seeing two pieces come together and a greater picture emerge is something that, that can really actually be an, an awesome thing to experience. <laughs> but equally, a puzzle can be just as frustrating. Who of us has not stormed away from a puzzle possibly never to return? Puzzles are enjoyed in groups, but they are sometimes a companion to the lonely. I enjoy puzzles one month out of the year. I don't know if that's weird, but that's what I do. Every December, we have a same set of five puzzles. Some are 300, some are 500 that we set up in a downstairs table in our basement. It started when Braden was young. We put those puzzles together, and now it's a, an activity that we do as a family. Uh, we, every year, we add a puzzle. So this year, we got four done. We have one more out of this five-set puzzle that we try to do during the month of December. I love because it slows down time. It creates moments that I can just have conversations with my boys. Some of the time we sit down at the puzzle and we last two minutes. But you know what's interesting? Sometimes it lasts two hours. Today, you each received a very challenging puzzle. That was a joke. I think it's, uh, we'll count it later. But you all have a puzzle in your hand. And I would like to use that visual, whether you love or hate puzzles this morning, to help us wrap our hearts and minds around our big idea that the body of Christ allows me to play my part as a piece of God's big plan called redemption. And I want to take a deeper dive as we look at this whole idea of church membership. I actually want to get, like, kind of put that off to the side for today and just, just call us to this beautiful thing that we're called to be a part of, which is the body of Christ, and, and what that looks like practically in each and every one of our lives. Brett read the verses for us, and so let's jump into, if you have a copy of God's Word, I invite you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. There's also Bibles in the pew in front of you if you would like to utilize those. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're just going to look. We talked about everything has a design, and, God, and the church is no different. God has designed His church to be, first and foremost, all the same. You say, huh? All the same? Look around the room. I am not the same like the person next to me. Well, let's unpack this together, okay? Verses 12 and 13. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink Anybody finish that for us? One spirit. Drink of one spirit. Can't see the last line, but there's a word that's used that's not highlighted over and over again in this, and that's the word one. One, one, one. But I want to draw our attention, as you see, to the word all. How are we all the same? We are all the same because we have experienced the same thing, and that is salvation. Our oneness and what we have experienced in Christ, if you have experienced that in Christ, 
is a beautiful shared experience, both individually and collectively. But here's the important part of this. This is why we're highlighting this. This is why Paul started here. Is this shared sameness sets us up, and it's a precursor so that we become part of the whole. Our connection through Jesus Christ in salvation gives us the ability to be connected to the body of Christ. You cannot be connected to the body of Christ unless you have first gone through Jesus through his saving work in your life. And so Paul, as a great teacher, uses the analogy of the human body here. And the word members, he's going to keep using this word members throughout, quite literally translated means parts. And I'm glad that that means that because when we think about body members, we use the word body parts, okay? And, and so that's what he's going to address is that we, well, there's, there's many members, but one body. Paul wants to give the Corinthians the opportunity to grasp that they are individuals, yes, but they are part of something bigger and greater than themselves. Our sameness or our oneness in Christ is what is going to make our differences be a positive rather than a negative. Let me say that again. This is really important. Our sameness. The way that we are the same through salvation is what is going to make our differences be a positive rather than a negative. So we're all the same, but if you jump down to verses 14 to 19, we're going to see that we are all different. You say, huh? What do you mean we're all the same, but we're all different? You see, in most situations in life, Different divides. Everybody say that with me. Ready? Different divides. Again, different divides. Do you believe that? When, if you think about most situations in our everyday lives, different is a dividing factor in relationships and experiences in the everyday. Politics. Are you more unlikely to be close with someone that thinks like you or is differently or thinks differently? Divides. Sports. By God's grace, we've worked through some issues in this church of Dallas fans and Eagles fans. But there's a difference, and it divides. And, and we say, someone apart from Christ, that we think that's a small, silly thing, but you, some people take it, when it's an idol, when sports is an idol, they take it way too seriously. Personality clash. There's a reason we call it a personality clash. Because when someone has a different personality than us, it can often be a dividing factor. Gen the generational gap. Out there, being born in a different decade is a dividing factor in many situations. Race. Someone different than me can often be something that divides. Economic status. How you were raised. Just because you had a different way of being brought up can be a dividing factor. And I could go on and on and on. And you see, though, different divides unless what? The gospel is present. Paul is starting here with this oneness in Christ because he wants these Corinthians to grasp that division out there, the way that people are divided out there, should not take place in here. And I say that figuratively as the body of Christ. Paul, instead of just focusing on just ignore the differences, which is what we like to do, well, I'll just ignore the differences. And what we mean by that is when we ignore different, it means we're basically just saying, I'll ignore people then. Because people are different. And, and we can do that over big things, and we can do that over little things. We can. Like, just being uncomfortable with talking to someone that's in a different generation of us, we kind of just like, yeah, there's differences, so I'm just going to kind of, good morning, hey, good morning, hey. Instead of saying, hey, what, how can I embrace this in Christ? Look with me. Paul's going to unpack this. And you think it's important he starts here because look back at verse 13. It says, for we are one spirit. We were all baptized into one body. It's that, that picture of, of, of Christ saving us and, and us following in his likeness into one body. But then do you notice that there's not a lot of description in this passage. It's pretty general except that Paul writes to the Corinthians and he says, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. You see, from the very beginning, the church in Corinth was struggling with the fact that there was different people coming to Jesus, and they didn't know how to handle it. 
They didn't understand what it looked like. And they were trying to figure it out. And, and the uniting factor, obviously, is Christ and the oneness. But then it's going to be to learn to see how God uses our differences for his glory. So look with me. I love how Paul did this in verse 14. He kind of uses a little tongue-in-cheek through this whole thing. I don't know Paul's personality. I'm not going to speculate. But there's a, there's a little bit of hints of like sarcasm through this passage. For the, the body does not consist of one member but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And this is, I get it, this is a funny picture here, but if the whole body were an eye, that's scary to think about, kids. If the whole body were an eye, yikes, where would be the sense of hearing? And if the whole body were an ear, I think I'd rather be an eye, where would be the sense of smell? Where would be the sense of smell? We all know that the different parts of our body is what makes us work. If you have challenges with certain parts of your body, your legs don't work like you used to, you have back pain, you don't move like you used to, you understand this probably in a more real fashion than others. But the different parts of our human body is what makes us work. It's the collective. Likewise, the different parts of our body is what makes us work. Amen? That is so important. We, we got to understand that beautiful thing is that the different parts of this room is what makes us us work. And I'll tell you, that can be hard to really live out. It can be challenging. We all think that our part might be more important. Some of us think our part doesn't matter, but it's the whole. Look with me at verse 18. I think this is this verse here is just it's what it's all about. But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If we could just grasp that fact as it relates to the body of Christ and unity in a church, I think we could just absolutely blow disunity out of the water by having this simple understanding. That God has arranged the people in this room for his purposes. Because guess what? Sometimes the people in this room annoy me. They frustrate me. I don't understand them. But what if we always came back to this verse? That God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. I always used to love to play that would you rather game. And it was always like a silly thing like would you rather you know, cut your pinky finger off or your toe um, or something like that. And it's fascinating when you study the human body that, like, parts that you think would be just like, I'm just going to chop my little toe off today. Um, like, you'd have problems. Like, the balance of that, okay, would, would affect you in, in big ways, even though it's something small. You see, God thought of everything. He's the divine designer in our bodies, there's things that scientists don't even understand, like why is it there? But we know it's there for a purpose. The same is true in the body of Christ. You know one of the first things I do when I get a puzzle box? It's probably the same thing you do. What do we do first? We arrange the pieces, right? What do you do first? What's the first thing you arrange? Edge pieces, okay? We're doing this. This has a purpose. This isn't just to do it. Next, we, we, we start separating it by what? Colors. Now, your hardcore puzzle people, and there was a real name, but I couldn't pronounce it, they don't even look at the picture on the box. They're really cool, okay? they like, I can do it without a picture. I'm just going to put it together. There's people that do that. I know a guy that does that because he's like, I like the challenge of it. I'm like, okay. Um, <laughs> but when you think about the puzzle box, you start arranging the colors as best as you can guess to put them in the place because you're going to come back to that. And you're going to work and focus on that section. And as soon as you have your outside, and then you start moving to certain directions. And you see the, the picture emerging as you move through it. See, if we could see the body of Christ, and I ask us to consider this today. Instead of seeing the differences in one another, 
and allowing them to sometimes frustrate us, which they will, that we actually look at the differences in one another and realize that God is arranging our church family, his greater church, to be a masterpiece for his purposes right where he has placed you. He is arranging the pieces. Can I just stop for a moment? And I just want to say to each of you, if you hear nothing else, if you're asleep, wake up, and you can go back to sleep. Could I just stop and say to each of you that you are who you are because God made you who you are. You are who you are because God made you who you are. Kids, if elementary, look up at me real quick. Ready? Eye contact. You are who you are because God made you who you are. We live in a culture that cries out to each and every one of us trying to steal our contentment and who God made us to be. Proverbs calls this the foolishness of the world, tells you to be whoever you want to be. It tells you that you need to be more of this or more of that to be whole. That if you're not happy with who you are, change who you are. Go be something else or someone else other than who God has created you to be. If you are 18 years old or younger, please stand for me real quick. Don't be scared. You're not coming up forward. Chloe, thanks for standing and leading the way. Everybody stand up. If you're 18 years or younger, stand, okay? Don't worry. You're not going to have to come forward. There's a lot of other people standing. Can I just tell you, like I just said, that you are who you are because God made you to be. And so I need you to do me a favor, nice, loud, and clear, okay? Can you all help me read the verse that's going to go up on the screen right now, Jeremiah 1, 5. Ready? Read it for all of us. You ready? Go. Before I... Can we all give the young people a hand? Whoa, don't sit. Don't sit. Don't sit. Stand back up. I'm going to give the I'm going to give the two cool older kids a chance to redeem themselves here in just a minute, okay? All right. This right here is a very common verse. Okay? It's a very common verse. Um, it's a great verse. It's an important one for you and all you and I and all of us to read this morning. Because if you don't already, and I'm looking and speaking directly to the young people in the room, at some point, you're going to wrestle with your purpose in your life. And there's going to be all these voices calling out to you saying, this is who you are, and this is what you should be, and this is what success looks like. And there's going to be all these voices crying out to you. But I love what comes after this verse, because we often stop with the coffee cup verses, and we don't read what's after it. And you see, this verse was given as a special message to God by a young person Named to a young person named Jeremiah. We know he's young because he's about to say it. He's thought to be in his late teens when he writes these words. Read now. Let's try this again. Jeremiah 1.6. You ready? Here we go. Oh, sovereign Lord. Stay standing. One more verse. Okay, let's finish strong. Here we go. Jeremiah 1 7. Let's read it. You ready? You may be seated. Thank you. Awesome. I love these verses. I love these verses because that last verse, I am only a youth, is not just a phrase that the youth use. It's something that we all use. I am only this. I am only that. And we often respond to God in that, and we have this dialogue of the Lord calls us to something, and we respond with, but I'm only this. And what does the Lord tell Jeremiah? Nah, no. Nah. I've called you to this. You are who you are, and this is what I have called you to. Whatever age you are, 
whatever God calls you to, his plan is always going to be the best plan for your life. And his big masterpiece and what he's working on, be content in who God has created you to be. Develop the strengths that God has given you. Don't go look for the strengths that you think that you should have to glorify God. Use the church family. Use those that love you and care for you to help you cultivate that. That's something that never stops. As adults, we have to keep learning, keep growing. Because we all get stuck. We all struggle with being content in what God and who God has called us to be. God is an arranging God. He is putting you where he wants you to make a difference. Your personality, your place in life, whether young or old, your past, your present circumstances, all of these make us useful together as one. Paul is going to end the passage with this idea. And God has designed his church to be all needy. Huh? All needy? Yes, all needy. Look with me at verse 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need for you. On the contrary, The parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. Are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the great honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, and that there may be no division in the body but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, we all suffer together. And if one member is honored, we all rejoice together. The context of these verses is Paul is trying to help these young believers and this church in a very anti-God culture to understand that each one of them is uniquely designed, given spiritual gifts, that are a person's strengths. So it's interesting here that Paul is not just going to say everyone has, needs to have a quality or everyone needs to, be, to have the same um, platform. No, he's actually going to highlight that there are those that seem to be weaker. What was he saying here? What is he unpacking for us? What are these words that Paul is saying? Paul is going to say that those who seem to be weaker are actually extremely important to the body of Christ. So then we ask, who is weak? Am I the weak one? Are you the weak one? Are you the weak one? Who is the weak one? But this is where everything comes together. The picture is emerging of what God's masterpiece is. When it comes to the spiritual gifts, we all have areas where we're weak, and we all have areas where we are strong. Shake your head if you agree with that. You agree with that? Every one of us in the room has areas of spiritual strength, and we have areas of spiritual weakness. So from the perspective of the gifted teacher, a student in need of teaching is the weaker one in the room. To the gifted prayer warrior, the one in need of prayer may appear to be the weaker one in that moment. To the gifted encourager, the one who is going through life and is discouraged right now, that may be the weaker one. To the one gifted in service, the brother and sister in need of their care is the weaker one. Here's the thing. It goes both ways. When someone in the church needs our particular form of spiritual gifting or strength, we can say that they are the weaker member of the body. But when we need another's spiritual gifting or strengths, We become the weaker member, all needy. So in this context, weakness simply refers to a spiritual need within the body, a need to help others, a need that you might have been gifted to satisfy. Paul says that the weaker members of the body are necessary to the health of the body of Christ. This sounds so odd in our world, does. 
This is strange language in our world. We naturally assume that the strongest churches would be those in which you find no weaker members or less weaker members with spiritual needs. Like, like we're trying to get somewhere that we can never get. When it, where everyone is self-sustaining and in no need of teaching, no need of prayer, no need of service, a church that has arrived, that it, it doesn't exist. But this isn't the truth. We know this. The strongest churches are those where many so-called weaker members are present. Notice again in verse 23. Paul says that these weaker members are those we deem or who we can honor. They may appear less honorable because they're going through a hard thing, but that's actually who we, as the body of Christ, are called to honor. They are not actually less honorable, but until we really understand that this is the true purpose of the church, we are likely to perceive them as less valuable. The weaker members of our body are the most valuable members, Paul is calling them to, in the church, because the church exists to honor them by helping and supporting them with our strengths. With our strengths. If I could sum this whole section up, we gather so that our collective strengths may serve our collective weaknesses. We gather so that our collective strengths may serve our collective weaknesses. Sometimes I'm the one who's less presentable and in need of strengthening. Sometimes and other times we are the ones strengthening others who are less presentable. See how it all fits together so beautifully? One of the things that happens in a local church is when you're going through a hard time, instead of allowing that group that God has established in your life to, to walk you through that, we isolate ourselves. There's a shamefulness of right now I'm going through A, B, or C. This verse gives us the freedom to say right now, brother and sister in Christ, I am. I am the weaker vessel. I am needy right now. I need you in my life. Because the beautiful thing about that is when you go through that process and you are strengthened by your brothers and sisters in Christ, you are better equipped than when Someone else is going through a difficult time to meet their needs with your strengths that you have gained through your weaknesses. Pull out your puzzles. All right, here we go. You got them. I need one of you kids, quick, somebody give me a count of how many puzzle pieces we got. All right? How many puzzle pieces are there? All right, Jackson, say it loud. 11. 11. Does everybody else have 11? I hope you do. That was the plan. <laughs> One of the worst parts of a puzzle, oh, nightmare type stuff, is when you work for hours and 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 you have uh, just a couple of pieces left and you start to notice that, oh my word, there is more pieces left than I have in front of me. Panic begins to ensue, sweaty palms, everything. You begin to search. You crawl around on the floor. There's not a great feeling. A missing puzzle piece can be devastating in the puzzle-making experience. Let me tell you, a missing puzzle piece in the body of Christ can be a devastating experience. Can I just speak to you, brother or sister in Christ today, who have maybe been sitting here, no matter what congregation you've gone to for a while, and you've kind of been outside of what God is doing because you've been hurt, you feel like you're too broken, you feel like you have nothing to offer the body of Christ, can I invite you back to this? Can I encourage you that you are uniquely designed? There is no other piece like you in the body of Christ. And when we come together to create the whole, God is pleased because he has gifted you to do that. I don't know what that looks like in your life. If that's something that you need to unpack, come sit with me, talk with me, talk with someone else. But you are an important piece of God's greater picture. The last thing I want to do with these, you're going to get your missing piece on the way out today. You're all missing the same piece. And you can use that however you want. I give out different things sometimes. Some of you, it's really neat to hear. Like I had a brother this week say, you know the treasure chest you passed out a couple years ago? I still have that in a place because it encouraged me. 
You could put the whole puzzle piece together, or you could keep that one separate piece as just a reminder that I don't want to be there. I don't want to, I don't want to be separate. For, I don't want to be not using my gifts for the Lord. But here's what I want you to do. I want you at some point this week, today's a beautiful day, don't, don't go inside and do a puzzle, okay? All right, but when it rains, and it will rain again someday, um, when it does, I want you to put this puzzle piece together. I hope it doesn't take you that long because it's only 12 pieces. And here's what I want you to do. Greg, put the next picture up. I want you to stop and reflect. And I want you to apply names to each piece. You could do it as a family. If you have children, you could do it on your own. Like, however you want to do this. But I don't want you just to put a name. I want you to put a specific way that God used a person and their spiritual gifts to grow you to be more like Jesus. My grandma wouldn't say encourager, but both of my grandmothers, who I, by God's grace, I still have in my life, are, would be prayer warriors. Every day they pray for me. I've never, I don't think I'll ever fully know and appreciate what that means. But if you need to leave some blank, don't force it. Come back to this every once in a while, and as we go through this experience together, maybe you can start adding names. Names that you don't even know yet to say, God brought this person into my life as a part of my spiritual puzzle, and I'm so thankful, Lord, for, for the people that you have put together that I am now fitted together for your glory. Father, we're thank you, thankful for your word and the metaphors that you use to teach us about ourselves. Father, there's no amount of pieces that could properly put in perspective the billions of lives that have been transformed and fitted together for your glory. From days of the past to right now in our world that on the surface, if you read the news, it seems hopeless. But the news doesn't share what God's doing on different continents around the world, and people are being saved and transformed, and they're being fit together and finding their purpose in you. God, I pray for the work that you're doing here. Thank you, Lord, that we're not all the same. That would be scary, Father. You have created each one of us with different spiritual gifts. Some of us are raw and we're learning what that means. Some of us are seasoned. God, continue to allow all of us to be faithful in accomplishing your purposes in whatever part you want us to play, Father. We give you the glory for what you're going to continue to do in our midst. In your name, amen. On the way out, please don't forget your puzzle piece. Also, for those of you that maybe haven't had a chance to grab your pictorial directory yet, that will be in the gym um, on the table back there. Again, a tool for praying for one another and having communication with one another. Uh, stay tuned for the email tomorrow with the church docs. Speaking of uh, just the spiritual gifts of everyone, for those of you who are joining the mowing team, um, Jim is like, um, where'd he go? Jim just left. He's so excited. Oh, there he is, okay? Um, Jim is leading the mowing team. We were able to get a new mower this week, okay? Um, and that's how we're praising the Lord for that because we, we really needed one. The one that was there is 14 years. So now we have a new mower. So if you want to go out and that'll help encourage you, like I want to be on the mowing team because I can drive that. Um, talk to Jim. He'll be out there, but we're excited. And he's just one example of many of him using his gifts and abilities to serve the greater body. Amen? All right, have a great week, everybody. Let's live it out.